The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hey guys, it's Ben Nash here. I'm one of the co-founders at Ensemble and founder of financial advice company Pivot Wealth, which is my business baby I started from scratch a little bit over seven years ago. In that time, I've leveraged some of the learnings of the Ensemble community to scale the business to become one of the better known financial advice companies for high income accumulators in Australia. And through this podcast, you can join me each Tuesday as I have the absolute privilege of interviewing some amazing people where I'm going to selfishly be able to learn and continue my journey to improve every area of my advice business. Hopefully, you can learn a few things on that journey as well. Jump over to Ensemble.com and if you haven't already signed up to learn and share from others or simply download the app. This podcast is proudly sponsored by NetWealth. Imagine a world where you can offer clients access to local and international investments. A world where you can engage with clients meaningfully, backed by powerful data and insights with mobile-friendly technology. A world where you can build business efficiencies through scaled managed accounts and bulk reporting. And a world where you can get all the latest news, research and insights to spot the changes that really matter. Wealth is more than just money. It's about opportunity and progress. A world of opportunity awaits you at netwealth.com.au forward slash woo. Hey guys, Ben Nash from the Ensemble team and today I'm here with Dan Tester. Dan is a senior advisor at Tribeca Financial. Um, keen to pick Dan's brain on, uh, I suppose, his journey and advice, but uh, specifically around the, the focus that they have with clients, some of the lessons and challenges over the last little bit. Uh, Dan, mate, great to have you here. Thanks, Ben. Thanks for having me. I thought a, a good place to start is is maybe just talking through your advice journey and how you've ended up where you are today. Always a good start. Uh, for me, I was uh, at Westpac um, BT for a number of years, um, close to 10, and uh, then found my way out of the BT advice world into, I guess, my own little thing with a, a group of other advisors, um, which was probably a bit of a false start uh, for me to go out on my own. Um, and then COVID hit and ended up taking a bit of a break there. And uh, lo and behold, spent a bit of time reflecting um, on career, what to do, um, staying in advice or not, and ended up uh, spending a bit of time talking to Ryan, our CEO at Tribeca, and understanding what their process was around financial advice and what has now become my process around giving financial advice, um, which is a really strong focus on care, client care and financial wellbeing. And I've been there ever since, so uh, it's 2020. It's interesting. I, I've spoken to a few other advisors on the podcast that, um, you know, not a not massively dissimilar journey that started out generally at, at some of the, the bigger institutions or in bigger businesses and then, um, you know, decide that they want to to try doing their own thing and, and, and running their own show and, and then realize that it wasn't, you know, I, the ideal setup for them. How did that sort of come to, together from you, and and you know what was the what what was the key, I suppose, driver of making the call there? Yeah, well, I guess for me, um, you know, I think it was just the wrong time. There was a lot going on personally in my life as well, um, professionally, going out from the I guess the beautiful confines of working in a big business like the bank, um, and then uh, you know heading into your own sort of world. Um, it, it does come with its challenges and I must say that I wasn't prepared for those challenges at the time um, and, that, and that gave me a lot of really good learnings which I take into I guess today's world and, and you know how I carry myself personally also professionally um, and that also comes in you know through the advice that I give uh, the client care going that extra mile but also um, you know the mental health challenges that I faced back then and you know having a really strong emphasis on that mental health care and that client care um, that, that that's so important. Totally. I, I uh, you know, being a business owner and, and someone that's been hiring for advisors specifically um, heavily last year, took a bit of a break. Now we are looking for advisors again. Um, I love talking to people that have either either worked in a in a role that's in a small business where they have a really close connection to you know the whole flow of work and how it all fits together, or that have that have worked 
for themselves before because I feel like it does really give you a completely different perspective on all of the things that sit behind the scenes. And I know for me, like when I started my business, I had no idea about all of the the million things that you actually just sort of take a little bit for granted or just don't really think about that somebody actually needs to do that or someone needs to be the one that sets up an email signature or figure out what links go where and how this thing links to this other thing and what do you do, you know, for the uh, privacy policy on your website and, and all of this stuff. So um, I love seeing that lens. But, yeah, it is a, it is obviously a lot um, there. And I, I think uh, particularly through the last couple of COVID disruption, disrupted years, um, you know, it's another dimension to the, uh, to the challenge there. But you touched on uh, mental health, and I know that that's something to – that you guys have a heavy focus on financial well-being and how that ties to overall well-being with your work with clients. But I, I also know that you're passionate about advisor mental health and um, you know involved in a number of initiatives. Can you tell us about how that came about and and what it is that you're doing in that space? Yeah, Ben, that's uh, definitely a passion of mine. For those who uh, I guess connect with me on LinkedIn, and follow me, and my uh, my mantra is making the world a happier place for as many people as possible. It's kind of a daily thing, um, starting with myself. Um, you know, we all have mental health, whether it be a good relationship or bad relationship with mental health. And I think, you know, we're really privileged as financial advisors to work with clients um, who are going through their own challenges, and that shines through. You know, we get a lot of information downloaded on us. Um, a lot of the time when we're diving really deep, we're going into, you know, uncharted territory that uh, that could bring up some things for them, especially, I mean, our process working with, you know, behaviours and money scripts and stories that have, you know, been in, built into someone since their, you know, childhood. So, it does bring up a lot of stuff. And coming back to it, that, that um, play on mental health, especially, you know, the link between health and money, they're so intrinsically linked and so powerful. I think, uh, you know, it's, it's a strong case for us being up there with doctors and medical professionals in, in how we conduct ourselves, um, especially when it comes to, I guess, being like a GP for money, um, knowing where we need to take the conversation and, and where we can't go, but obviously making sure that we, we at the heart of it, are, are asking that next question, because that can be uncovering a lot that can impact the advice that we're giving and that mental health side of things um it sort of comes back to what you do in your own world and how you take care of yourself how the conversations that you can have um with others around you and especially in the advice community with all the changes that have happened not just through covid but since the royal commission um people who have you know lost livelihoods and businesses or had to make you know big decisions to to get further educated to stay in the industry um or others that have made you know uh, quicker exits um you know doesn't mean they're bad advisors it just means that you know there, there's a there's more care needed for those that are, are going through hard times from a business perspective yeah absolutely so i i'd still remember like when i first started working with younger people in particular that it blew me away how many of them came up with with mental health history in going through one of the areas where obviously you touch on this a bit with clients is around getting insurance covers in place and uh, you know, people talk about mental health and you see some of these statistics out there, but it wasn't really until I started working with people, helping them set up insurances that I realized that for younger people in particular, that I, I would think that if I never looked at the actual full on statistics around this, but I would say with our client group, it would be somewhere around at least 50% of them had some sort of history of um, mental health at some point, whether they've spoken to their GP about stress or anxiety or depression or something like that and um i think you're absolutely right that it's definitely so so closely linked with how people are doing financially what's going on in their careers and those two are linked as well and then that flows through to their lifestyle how they live um as well and i love i love what you guys do i'm, I'm on your email list and see the stuff that comes out with that focus on well-being um, like you, I, I feel incredibly privileged to be able to help people solve some of these problems to alleviate some of that stress and, stress and pressure that can come um, a, a around money. And I, I think it's great to see the industry moving in that direction. I think that um, getting, as you say, being held to the same sorts of standards as other professionals in this space, given how critical that responsibility is, um, is, is something that probably makes makes a lot of sense. Tell tell us, Dan, how how do you guys focus on that? Like practically, how do you focus on it through the advice process? Yes, good question, Ben. 
we um, we've got a tool called the Financial Wellbeing Matrix that our um, you know broader advice business of, and investment committee and, and a range of people have sort of come together and you know in that advice process have actually said, hey, what do we need to do to uncover people's relationships with money and our big focus on helping people improve that. So the Financial Wellbeing Matrix helps understand first of all. Um, what it is, what what uh, financial well-being is, so it helps to explore, you know, the relationship b- between security uh, and freedom of choice, which are two of the key, probably the most important emotions that one feels when it comes to um, explaining, you know, what finance is all about or what money means to them. So then we break it down into four separate sort of sections and say, okay, well, let's look at now in the present time and focus on security and freedom of choice. So in the security area, we speak about control of money. So what comes in what goes out and we get them to score themselves in all of the four quadrants, um, score out of one to 10. 10 being nothing needs to change, I feel perfectly fine. And one being white flag is up and this is a catastrophe and we need some some help. Um, we focus then on the freedom of choice and how they use their money now. Are they allowing themselves the ability to you know, fall into those bad behaviors of you know, Uber Eats and um, going out more often, um, spending you know, discretionarily on things that maybe they don't need to or they shouldn't uh, given them. Cost of living is increased. Um, these types of things do weigh heavily into what's happening uh, in their in their sort of hip pocket on a month to month basis or week to week basis. So, and then we take it into the future and we look at that security measure, focusing very much on their capacity to absorb financial shock. So, if it is someone who's really worried about money now, you can only imagine how they're going to feel about their financial position if we you know took it a couple of years down the track. You know what does mm. what keeps them up at night um, and what's going to continue to do so. And that could be as simple as having the rainy day funds and having a, a strategy to put some cash aside to, to have a safety net, all the way through to that insurance analysis of, you know, do you have the right cover in place to protect your income if something happens to you, if you have a mortgage that's now costing a lot more, um, you know, what are the provisions that you have in place? And then that freedom of choice in the future is what are your goals? How have you actually defined these and where can we get involved to help really articulate them and start working towards them? I love that because I sort of nerd out on the money psychology side of things. And when I was doing the research for my first book, I found that they're, they're one of the big challenges when it comes to financial planning generally is that people really struggle to identify with their future self. Like, how are they going to feel? What are they going to want? What's going to be important to them? And, you know, being good with your money is really about prioritizing what your future self is going to want and need and, and potentially, you know, saying no to a couple more things today so that you can say yes to a few more things in the future. But because we do struggle to really identify with that future person, uh, then we, you know, we don't make as good a financial decision. So I think anything that we can be doing to get people to really step into the feelings around that uh, is only going to help with making better decisions around the, the, the dollars and cents. But you know, ultimately contributing to the well-being as well. So, I love that. Um, I love, yeah, the, the way that you guys get le- people to lean in uh, to that. How is that a, a relatively new thing that you guys are, are doing? Or like, what's sort of been the evolution there? Yeah, well, I joined the business when the financial well-being matrix was really, um, you know, getting up a head of steam. Um, you know, Ryan and the business could certainly answer those questions as to what they felt was the right change in terms of the brand and the shift. Uh, the Tribeca went through, given that it's you know 13 plus year business now, and Ryan has uh, has grown this business progressively since he was uh, an advisor and on the tools himself, and now works sort of uh, on the business rather than in the business from that perspective. Going back to your earlier comments about business ownership and all the challenges that are faced, but from that perspective, um, I came in at a really good time because it's when we were really defining how this was going to be. I guess not just taken as a client tool, but then also taken to the world of um, you know. Uh, general advice and potentially providing information to uh, employers, employees. Uh, and one of the, I guess, passion projects that I'm involved heavily in is very much doing a lot more workplace presentations and speaking to people on education around finance. Because um, financial literacy is so important, even if they're not the ideal advice clients. It's really about making sure that the conversation and the information that is out there is accurate. Mm-hmm. And it's coming from a professional source, not from a TikTok video or something that uh, does come, you know, with, uh, you know, an, an unlicensed approach, which is something that for us, I know we've got a lot of good advisors that do great work in the, in the social media space, including yourself. Um, but yeah. there are, there's a lot of unsolicited information that's out there. And if you're out there educating someone based on what they're hearing from an you know, uneducated source, that's, that's going to be dangerous. And 
financial literacy as we all know is so important, especially in times such as now. I was about to say this. Uh, don't don't go knocking a good TikTok video because they can be helpful. But uh, no, I, I get where you're coming from in that that there is a lot of noise out there, and and there's also some of the stuff that you just see and shake your head. Like some of it is is conflicted and dodgy, but some of it is just dumb and wrong. <laughs> and uh, you know, it's no wonder people end up confused. But I think that there's obviously a lot that we do when we t- you take on a full financial planning client that sort of necessitates a level of education to get people to making good decisions and confident yeah. decisions and actually taking action. But there's also so much that people can do for pe- to, to just get on the journey as well. And I think the more I think about it and the more I get into content around this, that money is like a muscle that you build over time. And I think it can be really intimidating or often is really intimidating. People think that they need to be an expert from day one, but they don't need to be an expert from day one. They just need to take the next step. They just need to, you know, set up that savings account or set up the budget or, you know, get started with their investing. And that's where I think those, you know, the the broader education pieces are so crucial to help people that aren't at the right clients for full on financial advice to put themselves on a path so that they can get to that point. And I think it's it's really great to see that there is more of that stuff coming through to push people along the journey and we're sort of setting up the future you know future clients of all of our businesses and the industry overall as well um yeah. so I, lo- I love seeing that out there tell us then and it sort of related but a little bit off topic as well that t- tell us about the male hub project what's that about <laughs> Um, yeah, so outside of financial advice world, um, one of the sort of things that I picked up over COVID, I was actually fortunate enough to uh, be introduced to this project that, that started during COVID or actually just before and um, was uh, just reached out to the CEO, Tony, and had a conversation via LinkedIn and said, hey, I'd love to get involved in something like this. This is my you know, story for want of a better term and, and something that I think I could uh, certainly help in spreading the word and giving back and being part of the buddy program and being a support person for whomever is out there needing someone to talk to. And um, that's really what the Male Hug Project was all about. It's really um, the demographic of you know a corporate male and then just thinking about in that world where I previously came from, um, how isolating that can be, how that can also be very um, uh, dangerous for some people. They don't want to talk about things within that environment because they may, maybe feel that job security is an mm-hmm. issue. Um, and and if it's not just about men, um, but it is because at the same time there's so many females and other partners that are out there that are impacted, and whether it be you know grandparents, daughters, um, you know whoever it is, uh, they're impacting the lives of of many. And having a healthy male relationship in your life is, and having the ability to talk about problems, um, concerns that come up, whether they be great or small, is the reason why the organisation exists. And uh, and that was just something that for me. I wanted to bring to the advice world. I actually saw it as a great opportunity because I, I was involved in so many situations in the corporate world that I thought, you know what, we kind of need, we need to, we need to get together and be able to talk about this um, and uh, and talk about the challenges that are faced or how people are feeling and uh, you know just look at the suicide rates uh, you know of men compared to women over the history of, as long as statistics have been recorded, it's it's been really high. In fact. Um, one of the statistics that jumped out in the mental health first aid training that I'd, I'd completed in the last 12 months, um, the only time it was actually a lot lower um, was at periods of war because men were off onto the battlefield and, and um, you know, that's when it kind of the statistics dropped away. But it's always been a stark contrast to where that actually sits. Uh, but it's important to talk about it across all levels. It's not just male specific. It's just that we don't talk about it. Yeah. And I think that particularly like touched on the last couple of years, COVID disruption, throw in the mix, um, you know, the, the need to, for a whole industry to pivot to working from our COVID bunkers and dealing with the crazy amount of demand for advice when markets, you know, huge market opportunity with the share market meltdown, property record, low interest rates, you know, a lot of, a lot of advisors are sort of off their feet, keeping up with that, as well as trying to manage the change to their lives and trying to manage the change to their work and trying to manage all of this legislative change at the same time. Uh, and I know from from talking to uh, a bunch of advisor mates and myself included that super challenging time to to deal with all, all of that stuff. Um, I know for me, like uh, 
you know, locked in the COVID bunker, trying to deal with business, you know, having all that business uncertainty, managing a team, all of those sorts of things that, uh, you know, it, it took its toll and it, it sort of took a bit of a, a lot of focus to figure out what the new, you know, normal was, how to deal with that, try to bake some routines into my life so that I could manage those things and do it in a way where I could still, you know, be a human being, be a partner, be a dad um as well i i uh i built in a couple of things that i, I think have worked well I, I certainly reacted not in the right way in the first lot of lockdown where you know not exercising not looking up nutrition not um uh managing alcohol consumption in the way that uh, <laughs> you're probably supposed to at least i think mm-hmm. so um so I'm interested to hear from you. Like, what, what's practically what what are some of the rituals or routines that you put in place to 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 help you with that stuff? Yeah, look, and I think you hit the nail on the head there with COVID. A lot of the good behaviours and good practices went out the door. And I guess this is you know something I don't want to be preaching, but it's it's just some some of the simplest of things. Um, we talk about it all the time in how we operate in the business. Um, it, it's really all about education um, and, and what we can do to educate ourselves on the reasons why we don't talk and those types of things. Um, mm. But first and foremost, having a good conversation with your connected people. If you're feeling really crap, pick up the phone, talk to those people that are closest to you um, or, you know, get out and go for a walk. Um, we, we practice, you know, taking our meds and that's not medication. That's focusing on the M, E, D and the S the meditation or mindfulness and and getting yourself centered. It's focusing even just the simplest of things like on your breathing um, and and controlling your environment and taking some time out to meditate. Exercise, as you sort of started to allude to, you didn't move as much through COVID, but we're able to have a little bubble. Um, You know, what's your exercise routine like? Even if it's just as simple as getting out and going for a 10, 15, 20 minute walk a couple of times a day, just to have a break, get up off your feet, you know, standing desks one of the greatest inventions going around just to keep you moving and keep you up on your, you know, from sitting. Um, diet, self-explanatory. Um, most of the time, you know, the, the age old saying you can't out-train a bad diet or having a really good diet to start off with is 80% of the uh, 80% of the work um, for what you put in your body and, and what you're consuming. Um, and then most important, our sleep. Sleep is one of the most important things. In fact, the most in ma- managing our mental health and getting a really good night's sleep. Um, you know, sleep hygiene, I was having panic attacks through COVID. Um, sleep hygiene was something that I explore, explored and experienced um, really great effects with. Um, just feeling this overall sense of calm when you, you know, stop doing things like, you know, having coffee, you know, from 12 o'clock, um, you know, onwards, the impacts to that caffeine later on in the evening um, are profound. Um, you know, just devices, getting rid of technology, switching off, and it's really easier said than done when you're running a business. Um, and, and dealing with clients in such volatile times. But it's about setting those boundaries and those expectations. And again, going back to education, educating your clients on what's acceptable and what's not, what the expectations of that relationship look like, and and also giving them some of that, you know, well, this is what I actually practice. And sometimes that can also help them. Mm, absolutely. And I think like money with this sort of stuff that it it can be really overwhelming that there's, and like a lot of the things that you mentioned there, that it's sort of, talked about it's something that he's maybe we don't talk about as much as we should but certainly people are increasingly aware or at least i am that you know you should be sleeping you need to watch nutrition you have to exercise you know all of those sorts of things but i know in the past it's like you you feel like you have to do it all and do it all straight away but i think with a lot of these things that you just need to do something you know like do one thing and then you and then you've got one habit that you can build in and then you can build on that and add something in or try and do a bit of habit stacking or um, whatever that you don't need to be, like you don't need to be a financial expert tomorrow. You don't need to be a mental health expert tomorrow either or a mental health, you know, Zen Buddhist uh, monk thing. It's like just to just, you know, be a bit better with your nutrition or your sleep or uh, whatever. But I know for me personally, I was fortunate that uh, through our business coaching community, the one of the the people that was in that community is like a breathing coach and breath coach. And for me, awesome. I'd never heard of that stuff before, but got some exposure to that. And I like it's a total lifesaver through um, COVID. And just it, I still continue it to this day, every day, like doing some breathing exercises that it's a, you take a few minutes out. It sort of is a bit of habit stacking that you forces you to five minutes, you know, not being uh, looking at emails or looking at a computer screen or, you know, 
dealing with a screaming kid or screaming partner or <laughs> whatever. Um, <laughs> just, just to sort of, uh, you know, give you that little bit of Zen time. For me, that was one of the uh, the real sort of catalysts that got things started. And then from there, you know, you can sort of add things in um, over time. But uh, yeah, I, I think it's all... There's, thankfully, there's a lot more information out there about things that you can do to to make it easier. But it's so great to to see that stuff, and I think particularly as advisors in the advice community, um, you know, something something that we could all always do a little bit more of as well. Yeah, definitely, and that's the one thing I guess from a um, I guess advisor care point of view, and and I guess spreading the word to the you know X Y ensemble community, making sure that you know there's com- there's communication out there, so. You know, my LinkedIn, phone, all those types of things, they're all available and on for anyone who ever needs to chat. Um, so, anyone listening out there, male or female, whoever whoever they are, whatever they're going through, you know, pick up the phone, send an email, um, reach out, happy to have a conversation and just talk, um, which is so important. It's great for the networking. It's also great for connecting and understanding different perspectives. Um, but most importantly, sometimes that problem shared is a problem halved and mm-hmm. it can be something that's so simple that just needs to be spoken about. Um, you, you talk about, you know, all of the things that you can do and like, you know, the habit stacking and all of those great things. Sometimes it's just that simplicity of, you know, making a simple decision um, has a profound impact. And it's all those little things like, you know, exercise, diet and sleep. We get spoken about throughout our lives as we're kids growing up and through high school and all the way through our adulthood. It's the first thing doctors go to. How much sleep are you getting? What sort of diet do you have? Are you getting enough exercise? These are kind of three things that are in our control. Um mm. The meditation side of thing is really important, um, but it's kind of the added thing and and breathing. I mean, without it, we're not here, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Absolutely. Yeah, and it's it's that particularly with that one, it's something so simple, but you just don't think about it. But it, it, it is just uh, it does change the game. So yeah, mate, changing gears a little bit. What's uh, what are you focused on today? Like, what's what's coming up for you? Yeah. Um, so uh, today, just getting set for a couple of presentations. We've got a couple of clients that we've engaged in some advice late last year. So I'm um, got a meeting soon after this conversation with that person to present some advice, um, which is exciting. Um, also on standby, uh, my wife's about to give birth to our, our first little one. So the little princess is uh, in the oven cooking away and uh, due date is only about a week and a half away. So um, certainly on uh, on standby for any uh, any changes in what could potentially happen, uh, and then having a um, a couple of review meetings with clients, just you know, making sure we check in, you know, setting some goals for the year ahead. So it's a really really exciting time. Uh, ben, how about yourself? What's on the agenda? Uh, well, it's Mondays are always a, a a full day for 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 me with um we are, we do all of our team stuff on, on Mondays and I. I tend to squeeze in a conversation like th- like this one, but uh, for us, a, a big focus as a business is working on our um, our conversion, and and so we were having a little bit of a chat offline, but making sure that we're converting the the ideal clients in into our business. So I, I think mm-hmm. like us, like a lot of advice businesses out there today, we're getting more and more inquiries coming in from people that maybe heard a bit more about financial advice or have seen. Stuff online about advice and wondering if it is right for you uh, or for them um, and we're sort of trying to get a little bit tighter on how we screen to make sure that we're helping and educating people that maybe aren't right for advice today but putting them on the journey to be you know there for the future but for the ones that are that making sure that we're getting really clear on you know what they should expect where the value is going to be and setting those expectations the right way for the start so it sets up the whole process for success i think us like i know that you guys are really great at this as well they sort of realize that you can't be all things to all people and Mm -hmm. um, there's so many great advice businesses out there that we know that if we're not the right fit for someone that's looking for help that there's another there's going to be another business that is it's just about finding that right fit and we'd rather spend our time working with people that are the ideal fit because we know that it's going to be you know half as much work or maybe you know, uh, maybe a quarter as much work as some, trying to squeeze someone in that's not the, you know, not the ideal match. We'd much rather sort of connect them with someone that can help with exactly what they're looking for. If that yeah, makes sense, so true, so true. What's my my last question for you? And I could I could sort of shoot the breeze on that one all day. But uh, if you were to go back to your you know bright eyed, bushy tailed self, starting out in the advice industry, and give yourself one piece of advice, what would it be? Mm. 
that's a that's a tough one. But starting up, I probably would have um, I probably would have left the bank environment a lot sooner. I had a couple of opportunities mm-hmm. with smaller practices to go out and um, get more involved in a smaller business and the growth of that business earlier. Mm. But security, freedom of choice, lifestyle goals, all the things that were happening at that time didn't afford that. And if I was to go back, I would have uh, I would have relished that opportunity a lot sooner in my career. Yeah, it's an interesting one. I know I got my start in a bigger in a bigger business as well, and it's it is scary when you um, be considering taking that leap, particularly if it's what you've known that you know there's all this uncertainty, and um, we tend to you know in that you can sort of put, stick to what's safe um, in that as well. But I I love talking to people that's particularly going into small businesses and they you see how much of an impact they can have like directly as opposed to just being part of a, a massive machine. Um, so that's so great to see. But mate, thank you so much for sharing your your insights. Uh, I feel like for the the next conversation that we have, we can focus on you know how to master the juggle between first time parent and you know work business and bias family and all of that sort of stuff. But I suppose that's uh, that's a conver- conversation for another day. Yeah, um, definitely, Ben. But mate, good luck with that. Uh, and thank you again. Really appreciate the insights. No, thanks for your time. Thanks for having me, and uh, look forward to our next chat.